Welcome to the Bowers Museum. I'm Lin Lu, and I will be guiding you through a virtual highlights tour of Ancient Arts of China, a 5,000-year legacy. Of course, this will provide just a glimpse into the treasure trove that makes up this exhibition, and we hope you'll join us on site soon to fully immerse yourself in the wonder of this collection. While you're here, you'll also discover eight other permanent collection galleries and our current featured exhibitions, which are created in partnership with world-class institutions from around the globe. Visit Bowers.org for tickets and more information to start planning your trip today. With its rich legacy spanning more than five millennia, China is one of the world's richest and oldest civilizations. Now, as China is poised to become the world's largest economy, it is essential to learn more about where this great civilization came from through the study of its culture and artworks. In this tour, we will be walking through the gallery together, exploring Chinese history from the Neolithic period up until the modern day. We begin with the dawn of Chinese civilization around 8000 BCE, when Neolithic peoples living in the Yellow and Yangtze River valleys began to produce the region's first artworks. Cultures like Yangshao and Ma Jiayao began painting pottery vessels with designs symbolizing or commemorating religious, economic, and military activities. They produced four distinct types of ceramics in different eras and areas. This wine vessel was made during the Ben Shan phase. It inherited earlier black and red motifs, but added more complex and elegant designs and a high level of decorative technique. China's Neolithic age lay the foundation for later ones where magnificent bronze, ceramic, and porcelain pieces would record changes in its citizens' artistic sensibilities, philosophies, politics, and daily lives. We move ahead 500 years to the Zhou Dynasty, one of the last pre-imperial periods in Chinese history. Changing customs and etiquette led to a relative decline in the production of wine vessels in favor of cookware. The exaggerated and abstracted patterns of the preceding Shang Dynasty disappeared, and more realistic animal motifs were introduced. Around the middle of the Zhou, a system was developed where decorated cauldrons called Ding were used as prestige objects in addition to their use in rituals and cooking meat. High-ranking officials recorded special occasions by casting Chinese characters directly onto the bronzes. Over time, they became epigraphs, telling modern researchers a great deal about Zhou dynastic life. The subsequent Warring States period was characterized by political discord as schisms created seven separate Chinese states. Despite this conflict, the relatively new philosophy of Confucius spread across the region, crystallizing philosophical tenets which remain fundamental to Chinese society today. Several artistic developments as well as the refinement and standardization of earlier utilitarian objects took place during this period. Bronze mirrors, used in daily life and in rituals, first invented in the Shang Dynasty, are one such example. This Warring States era mirror has a knob centered in a square field and surrounded by four angled mountain symbols. The design became pervasive throughout China, especially in the central Yangtze River Basin and the Chu State. The Han Dynasty followed shortly after the first Qing Emperor unified China. The New Harmony proved a powerful force for combining the mythology and poetic expression of southern China with the North's history and Confucian philosophy. The result was a new language of Chinese motifs which blended pantheism and artistic expression. Lacquerware was graced with clouds and heavenly beasts for the first time. Bronze work continued to be a favored artistic and practical medium. The importance of the afterlife during this period resulted in the expansion of the Qing Dynasty practice of being buried with terracotta likenesses of one's belongings. Animals, servants, and tomb guardians 
all with the intent of bringing these things into the world of the dead. These remarkably animated horses were created just for that purpose. During the Tang Dynasty, household objects made from jade, agate, or precious metals like gold and silver became symbols of affluence. Bronze mirrors reached their zenith in terms of quantity and quality, and the dragon was further popularized as a symbol of imperial authority. Sanshai ware is a distinctive product of the Hai Tang period. Green and brown glazes were applied over a clear glazed white clay to create tri-colored ceramics. Sometimes an indigo color was added, but such pieces still go by the same name. The most masterful works blended the glazes together to great effect. China's culture and commerce developed greatly under the thriving urban economy of the Song Dynasty. Domestic demand for highly embellished Cizhou ware was rivaled only by international demand for Jingdezhen, blue and white porcelain, and Longquan's jade green celadon. Chinese porcelain became the symbol of China to the rest of the world. This Cizhou ware vase was made using a process called scrofido. The vessel is first shaped and given a white slip before being covered with a dark liquid glaze. Once the glaze has dried, it is carved to create a design using the white slip beneath. Only then is the vessel fired in a kiln. This style was principally made during the northern Song and Jing dynasties. Freedom of religion and anti-discrimination policies established by the conquering Mongolian rulers of the Yuan dynasty created a period of peaceful coexistence in China. Besides Buddhism and Taoism, Islam and Christianity were practiced in smaller numbers across the country. After the court converted from shamanism to Tibetan Buddhism, religious symbols like lily petals became popular decorative motifs. It was also during the Yuan Dynasty that Chinese artisans were introduced to cloisonne. The design for this Yuan Dynasty porcelain was applied in cobalt blue, then coved under a clear glaze, sometimes earning it the name underglaze blue. With the transition of the Yuan Dynasty to the Ming Dynasty, control of the country was returned from invading Mongolian rulers to the Chinese. The centralized power structure of the Ming Dynasty stifled creative exploration but allowed artists to further refine the quality of their crafts. New imperial kilns made Jingdezhen a world capital for porcelain and ceramics. When valuable pieces of red and tricolor glazed porcelain did not meet the high standards of inspectors, they were destroyed. Other imperial workshops produced colorful cloisonne with interlaced floral patterns and lacquerware using new techniques like gold outlining, painting, carving, and inlaying. In the Ming Dynasty, scholar studies became necessities for anyone who considered themselves members of China's Illuminati. These studies were quiet, private places where one could explore philosophy, classical literature, poetry, and the teachings of Confucius, and where the fine arts of calligraphy, painting, writing, and music were practiced. The tools and furnishings placed in these studies became as refined and sophisticated as the interests themselves. Paper, brush, ink, and inkstone were so essential to the scholar, they were known as the four treasures of the scholar's studio. To paint, ink cakes were ground and mixed with water in the inkstone, which served as a receptacle where the scholar dipped his brush before applying it to paper. The last imperial dynasty of China continued to push artistic achievement forward, in part by incorporating Western discoveries, innovations, styles, and techniques into traditional Chinese art and culture. The port town of Shanghai grew into a commercial metropolis where foreign interests guided burgeoning export markets. Painters from all over the country gathered there and synthesized Western and traditional Chinese painting elements and colors to create a new school of art. 
the introduction of tobacco by European missionaries shortly before the Qing dynasty inspired the first Chinese pipes. In the late 17th century, the Kangxi Emperor is credited with the development of handheld snuff bottles used to keep snuff, a mixture of dried tobacco and aromatics, from getting ruined in China's humid climate. These small containers quickly became some of the most dynamic objects produced in imperial workshops. Robes were standard pieces of Qing Dynasty court attire. Like imperial hats and adornments, different robes were worn based on the formality of the occasion and often denoted one's rank. The various sections of these robes were woven as one bolt of cloth. When completed, individual parts were cut from the fabric and sewn together to create the finished robe. In October of 1911, a group of revolutionaries led a successful revolt against the Qing dynasty, and in doing so established the Republic of China. We can see in artworks by 20th and 21st century artists that traditional Chinese arts did not disappear with the end of the country's imperial period. They continued to be practiced as they had always been, or evolved. Yu Youren, the renowned artist, scholar, and political activist behind these two paintings, was best known for using an ancient style of cursive calligraphy. Together, the artworks read, Only with high aspirations can one discover the truth of all things and only with a peaceful mind can one find the essence of nature. In touring this exhibition, we have explored how art both informs and is informed by the evolving culture of China throughout the past 5,000 years, from the earliest Neolithic ceramics painted to beautify otherwise utilitarian objects, all the way through to contemporary calligraphy paintings intended to spark philosophical thought and evoke emotions. The art of China evidences the steady but ever-changing nature of the world's oldest continuous civilization. We hope that you enjoyed our virtual tour of Ancient Arts of China, a 5,000-year legacy. If you enjoyed this exhibition, please consider taking a deeper dive into the subject by visiting Bowers Museum in person, participating in the exhibition's virtual public tour led by our docent guild, or watching some of our featured lectures. All exhibition-related events can be found on the Bowers Museum's online events calendar at bowers.org. Thank you, as always, for your support.